In the first century, following the death of Jesus, Jewish Christians, Jews who accepted the gospel, pointed to Old Testament prophecies to show non-Christian Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. This claim was extremely difficult to accept for many Jews because Jesus was executed by the Romans. The Jews of Jesus' time were expecting a Messiah who would defeat the Romans, not one who would be mocked, tortured, and killed by the Romans. But what if the Old Testament, properly understood, predicted a Messiah who would die for the sins of Israel and for the sins of the world? Here's Dr. Michael Brown on Old Testament prophecies about the death of the Messiah. It's really important when we look at Old Testament prophecy to recognize that God said to Abram, Abraham, that through his seed, the whole world would be blessed. And then when you get to the end of the book of Genesis, we focus on the tribe of Judah, and there will be a ruler from the tribe of Judah, and the nations will be gathered in obedience to that one. And then as you get further on in the Old Testament, it's, it's David who's singled out, and David becomes the prototype of the Messiah. We even have in, in passages like Ezekiel 34 that the future messianic king is called David. But we see that David was unique. He was the king, but he also performed priestly functions at different times. And in Psalm 110, speaking of David slash the Messiah, it says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then in Zechariah, the third chapter and the sixth chapter, Yehoshua, Joshua, the high priest, is put forward as a type and sign of the Messiah. So the Messiah is depicted as literally a royal priest, a priest sitting on a throne wearing a crown. Why is that important? It's important because the Messiah, typified by David, is both a king and a priest. So as king, he rules and reigns, establishes his kingdom, brings justice, destroys the, the wicked. As priest, he deals with sin. He makes atonement. He intercedes. He takes our place. So we see, for example, in Numbers, the 35th chapter, that the death of the high priest would pay for homicide, would pay for bloodshed. In other words, life for life, that the death of the priest, the high priest, would free the innocent manslayer. And we see prophecies that explicitly speak of the death of the servant of the Lord, this one who takes our place and is yet a light to the nation. So when we look in Isaiah 42 and 49, we see the servant of the Lord who can't be the nation of Israel because Israel is in exile because of its sin. And yet this servant of the Lord will redeem Israel from exile. This servant of the Lord will have a mission to Israel that appears to fail and yet he'll be a light to the nations. When we get to Isaiah 50, we see that the same servant of the Lord is terribly beaten for his obedience to God. And then when we get to the end of Isaiah 52, verse 13 down through Isaiah 53, 12, it paints this picture of the same servant of the Lord who will function now as a priest and make atonement. And the language of Isaiah 53 is filled with priestly imagery. It says that he'll be highly exalted, even in a God-like way, similar to the way God's exalted in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, high and lifted up. And yet it says of him, he's going to suffer terrible disfigurement. You can't even tell he's a man. And then as you get into the 53rd chapter, it speaks of him being bruised and wounded, being cut off from the land of the living. It speaks of his death. It speaks of his burial. It is absolutely explicit and undeniable. And, and, it, and it says that, that he carried our pains and our, and, and, our, and our sorrows. We thought he was suffering for his sin. But it, instead, we realized it, it was our sin that he was bearing. So that's laid out. Even Isaiah 53 goes on to speak of him living on a long life after death, which is what we call resurrection. So it's very explicitly spell, spelled out in Isaiah 53. When you go to Zechariah 12, 10, which speaks of a final war against Jerusalem and all the nations of the world gathering to destroy, it, it says in verse, uh, verse 10 of Zechariah 12, he beat to the Eli to share to Carl, they'll look to me whom they've pierced for Safdiolav and they'll mourn over him. That there will be a time when the nation of Israel recognizes that the one that they rejected, the one that they thought was, was evil or, or responsible for their sufferings because of church anti-Semitism and things like that, they'll realize that he's the savior. And just as the recognition comes in Isaiah 53, he died for our sins, not for his. Here also they'll look to the one who was pierced in Zechariah 12. And then you have Psalm 22, which is the psalm of an ideal righteous sufferer. But nowhere in the life of David did he suffer 
in these ways and to this level. It's not recorded of anyone in the Old Testament that suffered in this level and then was delivered from the jaws of death, seemingly forsaken by God, given over to die, and yet delivered from the jaws of death so that the whole world will come to praise the God of Israel through it. So Jesus comes and fulfills what's written in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. Psalm 22 is one of those passages, the Psalm of the Righteous Sufferer, delivered from the jaws of death and whose deliverance brings praise to the ends of the earth. That now actually shines forth that Jesus, Yeshua, is the one who fulfills it. So the language is there in various passages, death, violent death, burial, deliverance from death, no mistaking, that's what happened with Jesus and it was laid out in advance. As shocking as Jesus' death was to his followers, it apparently wasn't shocking to God who declared ahead of time through his prophets that the Messiah would suffer and die. Yes, the Messiah was flogged. Yes, the Messiah was pierced with nails, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Those words were written seven centuries before the death of Jesus. Seems to me that when everything looks like it's falling apart, God knows what he's doing.